Lakelands at home where this morning um, we're going to look at this subject of camouflaged Christianity hidden in plain sight and I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 5 if you want to follow along Matthew chapter 5 beginning at verse 14 and this is what it says you are the light of the world a city set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. 
Do you know, from those few verses, I think it's abundantly clear. In fact, I don't think it could be any clearer that God has intended that everyone who believes in him, every single born again child of God is to be light in this world. We are to be seen. We are to be noticed. Everything, everything we say and do is to be noticed. We're to be beacons of light set high so that everyone can see. Yeah, shining with, with God's love, glowing with hope, beaming with compassion and care for those around us. Reflecting the light and the glory of Jesus through our lives. And ultimately, you know, we're not actually drawing uh, attention to ourselves. It's like we're signposts. And signposts are, are not the destination, are they? Signposts point the way to the destination. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and what? Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We point the way to Jesus. Yet, you know, as Christians, this world tries to condition us to do the exact opposite. This world wants us to live lives of camouflaged Christianity, hidden in plain sight. And you know, for us as Christians, there are lots and lots of issues with this. And not least of which is the fact that it's the direct opposite of what we've been called to do here in in Matthew chapter 5, 14 and 15. And I will come back to this. But just take a second or two and think about camouflage itself. What is camouflage? How does camouflage work? Do you know it's actually not so very long ago, relatively speaking anyway, that armies going into battle, they actually worked on the principle of being seen on the battlefield. And in battle, you might have seen uh, lines and lines of bright red, blue, yellow, white, Uniformed soldiers are all in these these lines marching or advancing towards you. And the whole idea of that was that it it was to intimidate you as the enemy when you've seen this army coming. And it was also, I think, meant to encourage those who were in the lines and were advancing. But towards the end of, uh, I suppose, the 19th century through World War One and World War Two, warfare changed dramatically. And with it, the military began to recognise the benefits of camouflage and stealth. And now we know that it's, you know, it's the norm for every soldier going into battle that he's wearing camo gear. And you all, I'm sure, know very well that the whole idea of using camouflage is to not be seen or noticed. It actually might be possible to physically see you, but with good camouflage, you can be seen but still remain hidden in plain sight. You see, good camouflage makes use of what's around you. Maybe you might use branches or, 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 or leaves or grass or whatever. And if it's, if it's really good, you will, be, you will completely blend in with your surroundings. And that's the point for us. You see, to blend in means we have to look exactly the same as everyone else around us. It means that we are the ones who have to change our behaviour to fit in. And instead of our minds being cleansed and, and washed by the word, it then becomes stained and polluted by the world. Ephesians 4, 22 and 24, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Blending in, fitting in with the word so as not to be noticed, it again is going to result in the exact opposite of God's heart for us. We won't be putting off the old self. In fact, we're going to be strengthening it. We're going to be bolstering it. We're going to be encouraging it. The spirit of our minds will not be renewed. 
and will certainly not be putting on the new self, the new self that was created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, to blend in might mean, for example, that we're not bothered by using bad language. Maybe we're watching and reading things that we know we shouldn't so that we can be part of a conversation about them with our friends later on. How are we at work, for example? <laughs> Look at this picture. What do you think this is? Well, I'll tell you. These are the contents of a secret man cave that was, was discovered fairly recently below the train tracks at New York's Grand Central Terminal. <laughs> and it was complete with a flat screen TV, a sofa bed and a stocked fridge. And that wasn't a room for some sort of Tom Hanks type of guy stranded from moving on. And if you've seen the film The Terminal, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about here. This was a room, this was a place where workers who were in the know, where they were able to go and eat and sleep and watch TV while they were paid for working. That's maybe an extreme example, but how are we at work? Are we honest with our time? Filling in expenses and so on. To blend in might decide that we look the other way as, as other people act illegally or immorally. Or maybe we even get involved in questionable actions ourselves. I can remember when Leslie and I moved to Carrick and Shannon. Do you know there were opportunities, there were ways, there were means that we could have evaded certain bills and things. If we had just kind of slipped behind some worldly cam camouflage and not drawn attention to ourselves in certain ways. But we chose not to do this, even though we could have done actually without anybody finding out. And I'll be honest here, it, it cost us. It cost us financially and quite a bit at that. Do you know that sometimes doing the right thing will cost you? But it's still the right thing. It's the God honouring, the God glorifying thing to do. And that's what we should do. Stay away from the camouflage of this world. And choose instead to stand and to shine for Jesus. I think we've just seen one answer to this. Next question, why would we even want to camouflage our Christianity? And yes, maybe at times there might be certain material benefits to doing this. But do you really want to put money before God in your life? There may be other reasons too, but one of the greatest tools that the world uses to condition Christians into living this camouflage life hidden in plain sight is fear. Fear can keep us hidden. Fear of ridicule, fear of getting it wrong and looking silly, fear of what others might say, fear of what others might think about us. You know, my friends or family, they'll think I'm a wee bit weird or something. I let you have a little secret here. You're actually supposed to look a bit weird to this world. Yeah, and not weird weird, okay, but different. If we're different, if we think differently, if we speak differently, if we act differently from everything that we see around us, we will stand out, we will draw attention to ourselves and yes, we might be considered a bit weird. But that's okay. It's for the right reasons. And yes, it's true that sometimes wearing your faith on your sleeve, as it were, it can lead to you becoming the target maybe of unwanted jokes and ridicule. Sometimes even outright uh, hostility, antagonism. But don't let the world convince you that people do not want to hear about Jesus. That's one of the greatest lies of the enemy today. And he has convinced so many in the church that no one is interested. Listen, they might not be interested in, in religion. And honestly, <laughs> who can blame them? They, they may not be in, in, interested in institutions. And again, who, who can blame them? But don't for one minute believe that people are not interested in Jesus. 
The key is how Jesus is presented to them. And the best, the greatest way has always been the way that Jesus interacted with others. And it's this. It's for God's people to live their lives openly for him in relationship with others who don't know him. But what about those Christians in countries where even to mention the name of Jesus can lead to severe persecution, maybe death? Surely they need to hide. Well, let me answer this question with a question. Where in the world is the church really growing? And I mean exponentially growing. Think about it. It's in those countries like that, countries where the, there is severe persecution, yet the church is flourishing. And it's flourishing not because they can advertise their faith on social media or YouTube, they can't. Not because they can invite masses of people to large meetings or rallies or programs in, in big buildings, they don't have any. But neither do they camouflage their relationship with Jesus. They don't blend in with the world. They quietly and intentionally live their lives openly for Jesus in relationship with others. And guess what? It attracts people to Jesus. It attracts them. They're beacons. They are signposts that are pointing so many people to Jesus. We can actually learn so much from these dear brothers and sisters in Christ, they, they have so little uh, materially. You know, they've probably never even seen, let alone attended a, a Bible college or anything like it. They just read the Bible for themselves and they obey what it says. The simplest way to explain it is this. They live their lives modelled on Jesus himself. Maybe this is something that we need to relearn, people. Don't allow fear to paralyze you from living your life for Jesus. Let me just say something, by the way, about fear itself here. Proverbs 29 and 25. The fear of man lays a snare. Have any of you ever seen a snare? Do you know how a snare actually works? See, a snare is often a wire noose. Uh, and it's set somewhere. It's set somewhere where you expect uh, your quarry to walk, walk through. And then if you're successful, the quarry walks into the snare unwittingly. And as it walks through the snare, it closes around the animal's neck. And, you know, try as it might, once it's caught, there is no way out. It cannot release itself. Its only hope is that someone will release it. And it's the same with this snare of fear, the fear of man. Once you get caught in this fear of man, you're trapped. Unless you can find someone who will release you from it. But let me read the whole of that verse in Proverbs 29. The fear of man lays a snare, yes, but... Whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The great, wonderful news is this. There is someone who can and will release you from that fear and his name is Jesus. Luke 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Rely on the word of God. Rely on the finished work of Christ. Trust in him. God, you know, God's well aware of the power of fear and the hold it can have over us. <laughs> so much so that you will find phrases like, uh, don't be afraid or, or be of good courage. You know, phrases like that or, or similar 365 times in the Bible. Every single day, God is telling us, don't be afraid, don't allow fear to be your master. Isaiah 41 and 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. 
I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When you encounter fear in your walk with God, meet it head on with faith and you will overcome it. In Ephesians 6, we read of the armour of God, armour designed to equip us to walk and to stand as Christians in the world. And it includes the shield of faith, Ephesians 6, 16, which protects us from attack. But notice this. Guess what the armour doesn't include? Nowhere does it mention camouflage. We've not been saved, healed, delivered, called, equipped and empowered to live our lives as, as they say, grey men and women blending into today's society and remaining hidden in plain sight. Do I say, but come back to this too again. So let's just remind ourselves of those verses in Matthew chapter 5 once again. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We are to stand out and be noticed for Jesus. We are to be signposts to Jesus. Let me just relate two quick things about signposts that I have experienced personally. The first one is this. I I know about a year ago or so we moved house. And where we live now, it's in the countryside, uh, just outside a small village. And on the small country road leading to our house, there's a a pretty sharp right-hand bend in the road. But, you know, right on the bend itself, there is a rough lane going off from the corner. And it's like it's in a way that you don't, if you didn't know it, you would think that the road carried straight on instead of going around the corner. But back before the bend, there is a signpost warning of this danger. And when we moved there several times, you know, I came down that road and I was very, very nearly caught out by this. Why? Because the signpost... It had become overgrown. It was hidden. It now blended in with the rest of the hedge and it couldn't warn you of this coming danger. Now in time I, I, I learned to watch out for this corner obviously but then one day I was sitting at home and I was thinking about other people on the road especially if they didn't know it and it's actually bothered me so much <laughs> one day that I, I, I took some... Um, I don't know the right name, printers, and an old machete thing that I have in the house. And I went up the road to the bend, I parked safely up, up the lane a little, and I spent some time clearing away all that undergrowth and all the, the brambles and the branches and whatever that were out in front of it, so, so that the sign could be clearly seen. And you know, as I think about it as I'm saying this, I'm going to have to do it again before too long because the, the kind of growth over the summer has begun to hide it once again. But... Well, what am I saying here? Well, we are to be signposts to Jesus, yeah? But part of that being a signpost is also a warning away from danger. Danger of what's to come, of of what might lie ahead. We will not be able to do that if we're camouflaged and hidden in plain sight. You know, if we have allowed ourselves to become camouflaged behind the undergrowth of this world and maybe it's time that we took the printers out or secateurs maybe as they're, as they're called and cut away whatever it is that hides us from view. Another quick story this happened a, a few years ago at a time when I worked for a Christian charity and part of what I did was to drive a lorry and the lorry would have been loaded with humanitarian aid you know food and, and clothing and we, we, we drove it out across Europe to countries like Belarus and Ukraine. And you know, to be honest, I actually, I, I really love those trips. Let me tell you, the sheer joy you experience when you see a child receive something, even just a small gift that they would never, ever normally experience. You know, we visited orphanages and the like. 
And to see mothers and fathers get food and clothing and help to feed and to care for their families. It's just so, so humbling, so humbling. You know, apart from that, it was usually a three day journey there and back as well. And while you were on the road, the phone didn't ring. <laughs> and if it did, you just said, I'm in Holland or wherever, and people rang, rang off very quickly. They, I think they thought it was costing them. But it was just you, you, your mate. There was always two drivers, by the way. It was just you guys on the road. Anyway, on this trip, we were on a return leg from Ukraine. We had driven to the border check checkpoint between Ukraine and Poland, which was about a three and a half or four hour drive from where we had dropped the humanitarian aid. And if you've ever experienced border checkpoints like this, you'll know that you can easily spend half a day or more trying to get through them. It can be really slow. And this time there was a question over the paperwork. Now, nothing badly wrong, but they were going to refuse to let us leave. And it didn't help that we actually couldn't speak any Russian. But eventually I rang our contact where we, where we had dropped off the humanitarian aid. I explained to him as best I could what was happening and I passed the mobile phone to the, the border guard, the border official. And as we watched, it just seemed to be that no matter what was being said by our friend, the only response he was getting was a nyet, nyet, or a no. And you know, the phone was passed backwards and forwards a few times until our friend said to me, give him the phone one last time. We could see the conversation kind of unfolding and, and then the border official just went quiet. He looked over us and he simply said, da, or yes. And he stamped the paperwork, he handed me the mobile phone and he waved his arm. So when we, when we got outside, I'm still on the phone and I asked our friend, what did you say to him to, to finally convince him? And you know, he said, it was pretty simple. There was a question over your paperwork and as you saw, they were just not going to let you through. End of story. So I just simply asked him to accept our explanation in the name of the Lord. And it was at that point that the official went quiet and decided to let us go. There is power in the name of Jesus. Anyhow, by now we were well behind schedule. It was after midnight by the time we, we entered Poland. And we decided that we would need to drive through the night. You know, there was a bed in, in the cab and while one of us was sleeping, then the other one drove and we swapped and so on. And I, I can't actually remember the reason why, but for some reason we were unable to return by our normal route, which we knew pretty well. And we had to drive a completely uh, unknown route through the night, through Poland on what are bad roads. Now, remember guys, this is before sat navs or Google Maps or anything like that. We had a paper map and that was that. So what I did, or what we did anyway, was to try and pick out the new route on the map. And I got a piece of paper and I wrote down the names of the towns and the villages in the order that we expected to go through them. And I got a bit of paper and I set the bit of paper on the dash where it could be easily seen by the driver. So off we went, driving on the pitch black on these bad roads, not really knowing where we were going as such. And you know, we managed to navigate our way right across Poland through that night. By first of all, recognising the spelling of, of the town names on signposts and then by following what the signpost said. And you know, I can tell you that without those signposts, we'd still be driving around Poland. We would have been hopelessly lost without them. There is a world out there who are hopelessly lost. A world out there in need of direction. There's a world out there who need to see the signpost to Jesus. You and me. One last thing to close with about these signposts. As we drove through the night, the only reason we were able to see them 
was because they reflected the lights of the lorry. They had no light of their own. Okay. Without the lights, or without the light from our headlights, they would have remained completely hidden. We have no light of our own. We only stand out by reflecting the light and glory of Jesus. And listen, that's, that's an encouragement and it's actually a relief too. You see, it's not through our strength, our power. It's not our glory. It's not our might. It's not our light. We can't produce this. And praise the Lord, we don't have to try to produce this. We just reflect him through simple obedience. I think it's pretty clear what this means for us today. And let me finish Let me finish by challenging each and every one of you, including, by the way, myself. Be noticed. Stand up. Stand out for Jesus. Be bold. Be courageous. Be different. Do not live your life in camouflaged Christianity, hidden in plain sight. Be the beacon. Be the signpost to Jesus for others. Amen. Can we maybe close by praying today? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for we thank you for technology. We thank you for the ability to reach out and connect in this way. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. And today, Lord, we thank you for the example that we see in the life of Jesus, how he lived his life, how he lived his life openly and in obedience to you, the Father, in relationship with others who were, to begin with anyway, far from you. And Lord, today we pray that we would follow that same example, that we would be deliberate, that we would be intentional about forming, about growing and developing relationships with those who don't know you yet. And in obedience to your word, Lord, we recognize, Father, that it's not enough just to know your word. It's not enough to, to, yeah, Lord, forgive us for settling for just knowledge. Help us, Father, and I to obey, to apply the knowledge that we have in our lives, that we might be transformed to be more like Jesus and that we might be shedding beacons in this dark world. Lord, we, we desire our lives to be signposts that point the way to you. Help us to reflect Jesus to everyone we encounter. And Lord, we pray, help us not to live our lives in any sort of camouflaged Christianity hidden in plain sight. Amen. Bless you all. Thanks for joining with us. Um, have a great week. Bye-bye.